Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here. And today I've got another interesting knife review slash knife overview to show with you guys. This is the Shuergroff Stellar, a relatively new offering from Shuergroff Knives. Where can you get these? You can get them at Recon 1. I think there's a number of other places, but uh, that's generally where I pick up my Shuergroff Knives. Thanks so much to my patrons for supporting me. Thanks so much to Joe for loaning this knife to me for review. I don't get to keep it. It'll go back to Joe when I'm done. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. And at least for the time being, you can follow me on TikTok at the underscore metal underscore complex. Let's go ahead and get some measurements here before we start talking about this knife. Overall length of the Stellar is coming in shorter than some of the larger flagship models, but still definitely a full-size knife. I mean, this is eight and an eighth. So blade length is 3.65 inches. Cutting edge is also about 3.65 inches. It has that magical Shiro Goroff sort of blade to handle ratio, folding steak knife look, right? It's just a little bit of a different look. Let's put it up against some of my personal uh, favorite Shiro Goroff knives from my own collection. The Quantum, that's a Gen 1. This is the newer F95. So you can see here, it is shorter, but these are much larger knives. This doesn't feel like a small knife by, uh, you know, on its own, just compared to some of its larger, older brothers, right? The F3 NS, it's another good example there. Uh, these are all about 8.75 inches with, I think they have 3.85 inches of blade, I think is that magical right? The blade length, yeah, it's about, that's about what it is. So it's shorter than those, but it's not a small knife. Uh, let's go ahead and put it up against some more common knives. Uh, any custom skills you find in this section can be found down in the description under original goat and other. So up against the 8010 and the 8020.5, you can see here it's kind of in between, but it's not nearly as robust as the 8010. How about up against the Spyderco PM2 and the Spyderco pair of three, if I can get it out. So you can see here, while it is about the same size as a knife like the PM2, the amount of cutting edge is insane. <laughs> they have mu much less of the knife is handle and much more of the knife is blade. But the Spyderco PM2 and the pair of three are knives that are known for uh, accentuating like ergonomic comfort over the blade length, right? So it depends on, there's not really a right or wrong, it's just your preferences. But aesthetically, I personally have to say, I love the comfort and the utility of knives like the Para 3. But aesthetically, the reason Shirograff knives look so good, at least to people like me, is because of that magical blade to handle ratio. Nearly one to one, it seems. Uh, let's put it up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue and the Hogue Deca. How's the action? Shirograff knives, legendary for their action. If you are new, you are probably, you, you, you might have already looked up the price and you're probably trying to pick your brain up off the floor and smash it back into your skull, right? You're doing the, you know, almost like the new guy initiation. How could knives possibly cost that much money? Right? We all went through that, all of us. Yeah, it's a real wet canoe paddle to the face, isn't it? Shogaroff knives have been around for a very long time, and they are absolutely not in the same tier as your common Chinese production knives utilizing the same materials, right? That's really difficult for some people to get around. If it's if knife is same material, why not cost same? It's because the number of variables uh, that go into the final price tag outside of the materials alone are vast. They're vast, but listen... The, like, I, I get people getting stuck on this, right? This is part of kind of learning about knives and things like that. And I'm not saying this to justify the final price tag, because while I do understand why Shogaroff knives cost way more than the average titanium frame lock folding knife from China, uh, I'm not in total agreement with their price tags on a lot of their stuff, right? So, just know, it's not a new thing. Nobody's trying to pull a fast one. Um, there are various tiers to the knife world, and there's a lot more that goes into folding knives outside of just the materials um, that, uh, you know, are, are being used. Um, but uh, back to the action here, um, the access to the lock bar is very good. Um, we are, man, we are close to double clutch there. Be there's a detent ball ramp, and that allows for a little bit of masking, right? Truthfully, where, when I say double clutch, I mean, 
I find it annoying when I disengage a frame lock with my thumb because the way that I like to disengage my knives is like this, right? A lot of people who manipulate frame lock knives, we like to do this with one hand. Now, when we do that, if it's a flipper knife, I really like, if it's not a flipper knife, I need a safe area that's not blade to land on my thumb. I want my thumb stopping that blade, then I move it out of the way and it falls without cutting, ideally, into my finger. Um, but uh, when it's a flipper, you like the flipper to stop. Uh, to be the stop on your thumb, right? By that point, the detent ball should already be well up on the face of the blade. This allows the knife to, you know, or the blade to simply fall into the closed position because the detent ball doesn't have to work its way up onto the face of the blade after you turn it. It's already there, so it just rolls shut. Now, this has a detent ball ramp, which is fine. That's sort of like a, a ramp where the, the ball rolls up the ramp and then glides onto the face of the blade, and that's fine. But the problem is it's only about halfway up the ramp by the time the flipper tab meets your thumb. And the blade's not heavy enough to assist that ball to go up the rest of the way. So you really kind of have to, like, turn it and let it drop. The, so you're seeing that I'm doing it periodically, but it's because I'm, like, getting my finger out of the way and like letting that flipper tab kind of slide off of my finger. This is not ideal. Truthfully, this is annoying and it blows my mind that sure go off knives. Like these, these, these are knives like designed for the nitpickiest of knife enthusiasts. It blows my mind that, and this is, again, this is a silly, silly nitpick because you could obviously just disengage it and close it, right? But how on earth are they still designing knives with this happening, right? Basically, what I'm saying here is that it's very disappointing that a knife that has so much style and flair and, you know, a company that's known for so much style and flair uh, and that's been around for so long making some of the most legendary knives in this tier would do something like that, right? I mean, it's it's not like they're not aware of it. And uh, they're obviously aware of people wanting the you know, ease and comfort of like a clean disengagement because otherwise they wouldn't raise this area right here above the show side skill for better access to it. So I don't understand why the detent ball can't be in a slightly different position. I honestly don't care about detent ball ramps all that much. I It's like, that's fine. I, you know, it, maybe it, it comes down to preference and how you en engage with the flipper tab or the deployment mechanism and how you disengage your knife. But I personally, I just don't care. Uh, and in this case, it's just like inching ever closer to a a much better disengagement experience, and it just doesn't quite get there. So, is it a deal breaker? No, because somebody like me is like a super ridiculous, whiny, nitpicky pocket knife reviewer, right? So it's gonna bother somebody like me way more. I mean, you. It depends on the type of person you are, but I would say the average person that's spending the money on a knife like this will probably go, huh, that's slightly annoying, and then get over it. To me, it really bothers me. So I guess it depends on the type of person you are. The pivot action itself is typical Shiro Goroff. This is multi-row bearing, and this is one of the things that allows Shiro Goroff knives to stand out. There's a difference between fall shut action on a $200 titanium frame lock that you get from China and something from Shiro Goroff. And it is impossible for people to truly understand that until you feel it. The multi-row bearings inside of this knife are, they're, they're, it's, it's wizard tier 100. It's, it's not the same type of fall shot. You, you literally can't even feel anything actuating in there. If I close my eyes, I would have no idea what position the blade is in because I literally cannot feel it rotating. It is so smooth. But that's generally the case with sure grow off knives, right? That's one of the things that they're known for. I will admit, though, that there are companies catching up to them, and it is no longer a magical, like, oh my gosh, they're the only company in the whole world doing it, right? In fact, it hasn't been that way for a bit. We're going to come back to that. But the action, like the flipping action, is all right. I'd say the detent on this one is a little bit on the weak side, but it does work because the, it, the pivot internals are so smooth. That flipper tab is also... On the smaller side, but there's an, uh, on the smaller side, but there's enough there to get leverage, and it is. It's also shaped in a way that's nice, and the jimping is nice, right? You can push button it, you can light switch it. I think overall, it's a decent, you know, experience. It's just I, I've had much better experiences with Shogaroff knives in the past, so this one's kind of okay, right? Let's do carry profile thickness up against the Spiderco pair of three. Um, it's actually a little bit thinner. Uh, this was a really, really nice carry experience. I really enjoyed carrying this. The size of it, 
just the compactness. And it was it was always amazing. You know, every time I'd flip it out, I'd be like, that I forgot how much blade this thing has. Like there's so there's so much blade on it. Length and height up against the PM2 and para 3. Where are we at here? There we go. You can see here that this really isn't that much bigger. Then the Para 3, it's nowhere near as tall, right? I, I can't say that it was that much of a different experience outside of just being a little heavier because of the titanium. Uh, it's it's far more compact, in my opinion, than the PM2, even though the PM2, I think, is, is actually going to be lighter. On that note, what are we looking at for materials? M390, yay. I You know, sh like, Shuagraf, I think, should, um, like switch to something else i mean even if they I, I honestly don't know how they're heat treating this this didn't really have a problem cutting through uh, you know cardboard and things like that it was fine the edge didn't fatigue or didn't like fall away super quick it was fine right but i didn't put it under enough stress to really test it i've never heard of shuagroff knives coming in at a low rockwell we have plenty of members in the community who are able to test this right so if this was a thing it would probably be widespread information. But um, M390 is fine. It's just kind of like, man, you know, there's a lot of other really cool stuff out there. And it's sometimes, you know, I see a new show graph release and I'm like, oh, cool. What's a steal? M390. <sighs> you know, it's like, <laughs> that's fine. It's a premium steal. But I can you guys use something else? Like you got you got other options. There's other stuff out there. But OK, it's fine. Uh, that's, again, I'm nose in the air, right? I'm holding Shuagraf to a really, really high standard, and they they seem to be unwilling to change a lot of things over a long period of time. And again, we're going to come back to that. We have titanium, titanium, and we have titanium back here and titanium back here. And then the lock bar itself is actually all steel. Um, there is no lock bar insert because it's not a titanium lock bar. It's just like one gigantic lock bar insert, or basically it's just a steel lock bar, right? It's a nested steel lock bar. Uh, weight on this guy. You know, it'd probably be handy to have my scale where we can actually use it. So uh, there is some internal milling on this guy. You can see right there. Uh, the weight, the stellar, is coming in at 4.23 ounces. So honestly, pretty darn good uh, for a full titanium knife, you know, with a 3.65 inch blade not bad the balance is probably still going to be slightly butt heavy not bad though it's really pretty good um let's go ahead and do a hardware check um i would normally get out my tools which are very inexpensive and very recommendable and that you can find down in the description uh listed under the the where the, I talk about the tools I use in this channel or the pinned comment. But I'm not going to do that because this uses, a lot of people call it proprietary hardware. There is a tool that you can get. Um, in some rare situations, I think the, they they actually send the tool with special editions. I don't know. Um, truthfully, there's a number of ways that you can adjust this. Uh, sometimes you can just literally just use your fingernail. Uh, I find that uh, taking some credit cards right and gluing some old credit cards or something rigid plastic right and taping them together and then sanding down the edge to mold a uh, a head that will fit in there perfectly um is a, a good way actually to get the screws out without marring up the hardware the number of uh Shugaroff knives i've seen on the secondary market where when you zoom in it, you can clearly tell that like some neanderthal uh, use the wrong size tool on the pivot and just absolutely dicked this up. Let me tell you something. I'm going to take an opportunity to rant here. If you own a Shuagroff knife and at some point you were like, oh, I need to adjust the pivot. And then you just jammed the wrong size flathead into that pivot and dicked up the hardware. If you ever get to the point where you decide you want to sell the thing on the secondary market, Every potential buyer of this knife is going to zoom in on the pivot and go, ah, I see another person has royally screwed up the pivot. I am no longer interested, right? Um, the people who actually want to, I'm not talking about the Steves from parts who have no actual interest in stuff like this and are just sitting back and commenting, oh, it's a tool. It's a tool. So who cares if the pivot goes? You're not an, you're not a potential buyer. The actual potential buyers who are almost certainly enthusiasts, right? Whether they plan to use it or not. 
I promise you, are going to look at that pivot and see that you messed it up. Then it's it's it's, it's going to make it to where nobody's interested, right? You're going to have to lower the price like crazy. I'm just saying, after years and years and years of looking, you know, being interested in Shogaroff knives and the model I want's not available because they can be hard to find, right? You go to the secondary market and you look real close and you see it messed up. Okay, so. Uh, if you find yourself in a situation where you don't have exactly the right size tool, use something that's not as hard as the fastener itself to turn it. Most of the time, the heavy plastic from an old credit card or something like that, sanded down, right, to fit this perfectly. It should, I mean, you can literally use the sidewalk to sand down the credit card or whatever you're using. Uh, it's multiple, right, more than one, so you get that rigidity. It will turn it. I've done it many times. Um, and uh, if you screw it up, you know, screw up your makeshift tool, no big deal because you didn't screw up the pivot. Anyways, rant over. There's a number of different ways to do that, right? But using the wrong size flathead is not a good idea. Uh, if you don't care and it's yours and you're going to keep it forever, right? And you're a, you know, use your crap kind of person, then yeah, knock yourself out. You know, go ahead. Use the wrong size tool on it. You know, use the right size on it. Even better. Um, but you can do that. Sorry. Words of a Nose in the air, nitpicky, enthusiast knife review. <laughs> Take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, anyways, yeah, it, it's it's actually a pretty simple construction. Um, you have a Chicago end and you have one fastener back here. Some floating pins here for the backspacer, surely. You have a secret or hidden screw for the pocket clip. You have the pivot and the female end of the pivot and that's your end of the knife, right? Uh, as long as you use the right tools for the job or, you know, as long as you're careful, you should be good to go. But truthfully, most of the time, I'm going to be honest with you, any Shogaroth knives that I've used, you know, for an extended period of time, and if the pivot does sort of back out a little bit, usually I can just use my thumb and it stays, right? I can back it out with my thumb, put some blue Loctite on it, get it back in there with my thumb, and it'll be fine. The tolerances are pretty darn good on these things. Most of the time. Anyways, we took way too long in that department. Uh, let's go ahead and measure blade stock thickness on this guy, and then we'll move into the meat and potatoes. So the blade stock thickness on this one, let me make sure that we're actually grabbing it on the flat. Yes, that's going to be right here, right at the back. 132,000. So not as thick as some of the bigger boys. All right, meat and potatoes time. Let's talk about the ergonomics of this real quick. Very nice really like this pocket clip. It is kind of a compromise between a stamped clip and a milled clip, but it is actually a milled clip. Really like this. Instead of just going straight, right? Like uh, this guy right here, which is fine, right? It's also comfortable. I like this. It has a little bit more of a bill and I found coming in and out of my pocket that was really, really handy. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't mind the little bit of the bill that I can feel. I think it's fine. Um, I find myself wishing there was a little bit of jimping up here, but it's not really that big of a deal. I wouldn't choke up up here. If you really need to, you knock yourself up, but I wouldn't. Truthfully, the knife overall is very comfortable, and Shogaroth knives has always done a good job of keeping edges from actually being sharp. And sometimes their knives do look angular, right? Especially stuff like the Quantum. This looks like a knife that might be a little bit angular, but really when you get up and you look at it, you realize the edges are really nicely knocked down, and it's not... It, it's really a very comfortable experience, right? Um, I really, really love, a lot of people I think are gonna knock this thing for having a, a nested steel liner. I would go the opposite. I find this setup, how they've done this, to actually be quite a bit more luxurious and preferable to just a simple titanium frame lock. The lock itself is not exposed, right? So like on the F95, the more I squeeze this, the more I'm affecting the lock up and the lock bar, right? Which bothers me. I don't like squeezing that thing. I don't want to have to do that. I like that I can squeeze on this thing, and no matter how much I squeeze, it's all going into the scale. I'm not really affecting the lock bar itself. I also just like how this looks better. The lock side is, you know, and this is, this is subjective. I mean, uh, everything I say is subjective, but... The lock side looks so much better because it doesn't have this big line on it. I honestly, like, I want to see a version of the F95 like this. I mean, it's part of the reason why I love the F3 so much because I don't have to look at the frame lock, right? This is a uh, just a simple, like, titanium liner lock. Um, I, I think this looks so much better, and uh, I really think that that's cool that they did that. I honestly don't care that the lock bar itself is not titanium with a steel lock bar insert because the it's the same 
thing. Like you, the whole goal is steel on steel contact, and then ease of like if they have to do maintenance, right? You got to send it in because the geometry's messed up or the lock bar's worn over. Just pop that out and put a new one back in, assuming they still have the parts for it. But I don't really care. I think it's fine, right? Um, they had to do some additional uh, milling to get that in there. They also have a screw. I was wondering, like, how do they attach it? You can see the screw head right underneath the pocket clip, so they've managed to hide that completely, and that's where it attaches on the inside, which is pretty cool. Um, so I like that. That's a unique feature here, or more unique feature. Got a little bit of milling right here. Um, I uh, am just... I'm like, hey, Sugar Off, when are you guys going to start contouring stuff, right? Um, I like this knife, and there's a, there's some other things I'm going to talk about that I, that I like, right? But it, it's it's typical Shiro Groff, and um, I think this would have been, like, the like really the end result of this review, because everything else is good. Like, it's got the typical, like, really, it's got the nice finish on it. It's a little bit different than, you know, your typical... Uh, like tumbled finish, just almost like an overcast finish on the blade. It's vapor blasted or glass blasted. I'm not really sure. It's got a nice swedge. It's got a little bit of, you know, a little bit of personality here where they, they knock this down to make the blade look a little more futuristic. I mean, little details that kind of allow Shulgroff knives to stand out over, you know, the cheaper competition. Um, it's all here. Like this is very shirogroff -y. And, um, I like that, you know, areas like this back here. Normally you would just have like this flat, area that would be just much less going on. You can see here, like little tiny details like this is what makes a Shurgoff knife stand out. I like that. It's not adding to the functionality of the knife, but it's definitely feeding the interests of the actual knife enthusiasts that are the, the real market for these knives. And that's cool. They did all that. Um, the, there are a lot of companies that are creating very real competition for Shurgoff. And I have to say, as the years go on, I still like Shirogoroff knives, but their high price tags are becoming less and less justified. Now, I'm not saying that their competition like the two to $500 market is like catching up. No, I, I would disagree. However, your $700 to $900 territory, right? Your Herman knives and your Koenig knives, right? You could make an argument for Brown. Um, companies like uh, Hog House. I mean, holy moly, there's some real competition out there, right? You might say they're not quite as stylized. I mean, say for the Arias, maybe. Uh, but it makes the, the Shugrov knives used to really kind of exist in this, like, wow, those are really special and truly nobody else is really doing the same stuff, right? Not really anymore. Uh, it's really, really hard to justify that price tag. Now, you're always going to have people saying, like, oh, I can get a clone for foot. And it's like, there's a number of problems with that. Um, I, in fact, it, it's it's hard for me to even want to go into it. But uh, I, I guess if, if you want to do that, you can, right? There are Chinese clones of Shirograff knives out there. And some of them apparently are pretty good. And they get really, really close, Right. You can do that, um, but that path generally leads right back to buying the real thing. So it ends up costing you a lot more money in the long run. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, I've seen countless times over the last decade. People buy hundreds or thousands of dollars in clones only to return and buy the real thing and find out that it's just a little bit better, right? Of course, the labor costs, the cost of making something like this in Russia, where I assume the majority of this is made is going to be higher than China. So that's going to be where it is. But uh, when, we talking, when we talk about the real competition, right, your seven to $800 territory, or may, maybe your seven to $900 territory, a lot of those knives are doing some pretty amazing stuff. And a lot of knives in that territory, people look at and say, that's, that's still high, right? The people who really understand what's going into those knives. So um, truthfully, I like a lot of elements here. I think this is really cool. The double clutch thing is, I mean, it's kind of halfway. Double clutch is like halfway up on the ramp. That kind of bothers me, right? Um, there's not really anything super standout here. And for some reason, they have priced this thing like it is one of their holy grails. $1,150. And I'm going to say I think that that's um, silly. I think that's a silly price tag. Not because I think this knife should be priced at two, three, four, five hundred dollars $500. I think anybody who says that doesn't really know what they're talking about. Um, and 
<laughs> Some people are going to get upset about that, but welcome to my channel, right? Uh, I think that this knife should be priced much closer to about eight hundred dollars. Um, I uh, I just don't see anything overly spectacular here. I mean, we have American companies making very similar things <laughs> for for much less, right? Again, like you know, anybody wants to to bring up that a lot of the companies that I'm referring to aren't doing things that are as stylized or as flowy. It doesn't like the machine works not as involved. The Koenig Arius, I would argue, is every bit as technical, as complicated, right, as precision. It's got all of those bells and whistles, all of that little teeny tiny extra stuff that adds up. And a lot of people say the Koenig Arius is overpriced for this market. So how can we justify? And that thing is contoured, right? That's contoured titanium. The machines that are required to do that are super expensive. This is, and it's just not justified. Uh, I, I don't agree with a lot of the pricing for Shure Graf knives. I think a lot of their, you know, flagship production models should be under a thousand. Um, I just, uh, it's, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So I think this is cool, but in, insanely underwhelming for the price tag. I do like the nested lock though. I, I hope that they plan to do more like this in the future. Um, so yeah, that's really, that's all I have to say. If you're looking for a Shua Groff knife, I would recommend, you know, finding a model that's under a thousand dollars. Uh, specifically, I still think the F3 NS is like the best priced and the best Shua Groff model that you can get. Um, but, uh, you know, if you really like this, knock yourself out. If you've got the funds for it. Um, it's just, uh, I think it, I think most people are going to be a little underwhelmed by it, especially Shure Groff fans. That's going to be it today, guys. Thanks again to Joe for letting me check this out. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do of course have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like. So check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that metal complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching everybody and have a great day.